So it's so good to be back with all of you. And uh, as Father Simon was saying, just a little over a month ago, I went from seminarian intern Isaac to Father Isaac, which I think has a little bit of a better ring to it. Um, And the ordination day when I became a priest, it was honestly the most joyful day of my life. Um, I was so happy stepping into this call that God had for me, and it really was a fulfillment of something that had begun much earlier. You see, I had always wanted to be a priest, maybe since the time I was seven or eight years old. I was raised in a a really good Catholic family, and my parents would read me saint stories. So I've always loved the saints, and I especially loved the saints who were priests, and I thought, I kind of want my life to look like theirs. So that was, you know, the extent of my discernment when I was seven. But things got a little bit more serious when I met a man who would change my life forever. And his name is Father Tim Devine. Now, some of you might know Father Tim Devine. He actually just moved to Nova Scotia around the same time I did, pastoring a church in Lower Sackville. And I actually get to live with him now, which is the coolest thing ever. Um, And so when I was nine years old, I met Father Tim Devine because Father Tim came and did a parish mission at my home church. And one of the things that stuck out to me right away about Father Tim is that Father Tim is blind. He physically can't see, which as a nine-year-old was very surprising. I didn't even know if that was allowed. I was like, you know, can he even be a priest? But he was saying mass. He was uh, such a powerful preacher. He was leading praise and worship on the keyboard. Like, I'd never seen a priest do any of that. And more than his blindness, the thing that, that stuck out to me the most was his joy. If you know Father Tim, he loves, he delights in being a priest. It just kind of radiates out of him. And so as a little nine-year-old, I looked up at Father Tim and I thought, whatever kind of priest he is, that's the kind that I want to be. So I went up to him afterwards and, you know, little, little Isaac came up and I was like, Father Tim, I want to be a priest, you know? And, uh, and he looks down at me and he says, you're going to be a priest one day and you should check out the Companions of the Cross. He told me about the Companions of the Cross, and I was pretty much sold at that point. Um, I went home, and I talked about it with my parents, and my parents were very good about letting me follow where God was calling me, and so they said, yeah, you know, they're a great order. If if that's where God's calling you, go for it. You have our support, and uh, with their help, I, I wrote a little letter to the Companions explaining my intentions. I drew them a picture, um, because, you know, that's good currency for a nine-year-old, and, uh, and I actually saved up a buck fifty from my allowance, very generous of me, and I mailed that off to them as a donation. And I, it was kind of like my, you know, installment in the seminarian fund. You know, I felt maybe the interest would accrue over time and I could pay it off in the future. But as I kept discerning, one of the things that drew me most to the priesthood was the fact that priests heard confessions which might sound a little weird. It's not because I had this fascination to find out, you know, the deep, dark secrets of everyone. Um, It was more because confession played such an integral role in my faith coming to Jesus that I wanted to have that same uh, grace being given to other people. Because when I was in high school, I began to live what I would call a double life. With my Catholic friends, with my youth group, I would live a certain way, you know, the good Catholic life. And then when I was off with my other friends, I would be doing all these other kinds of things that I knew were wrong. And they filled me with a lot of shame. And so I would still go to confession because that's what good Catholic kids do, but I was actually lying to the priest for years. Like for years, I was holding back certain sins because I didn't want God to know about them. I was embarrassed about them. And so these sins were never being forgiven. They were just piling up on each other. And eventually, I couldn't deal with the burden anymore. And I decided, Isaac, you're going to confession for real this time. Okay? So I mustered up my courage, but I was still a coward. So I did what maybe some of you have done. I went to a parish in the middle of nowhere, (laughs) far, far away, where the priest would never know my name. And I unloaded on this priest. I told him everything that I'd been doing, all the dark secrets, all the shame. And this priest, God bless him, was so kind. He didn't shame me. He didn't judge me. 
He just ministered the love of God to me. And I, I was sobbing in the confessional, just overwhelmed by the mercy of God. And I can't wait to meet that priest in heaven one day because he doesn't know me. I don't know even who he is, but he doesn't know the profound effect that his ministry had on my life. And it triggered again this response in me that I want to be a priest so that I can bring this same grace to people through the sacraments. Now, the psalm response of today that we sang over and over again as if to drill it into our minds was, Lord, you are good and forgiving. It's a profound statement that our God is a God who by his very nature is someone who is good and who is forgiving. He's the kind of God who loves to forgive us and to bring us to his goodness through conversion. And the primary way that God has chosen to do this is through the sacraments that Jesus has instituted in his church. That's how Jesus brought me back, right? Through confession. I experienced this moment of conversion. And I'm sure many of you have had a similar experience with the sacraments of the church. Maybe like me, you've had a confession where the Lord rescued you from the darkness of your past. Maybe it's when you come to Mass like we are right now and you experience the glory of the Lord when, when through the hands of the priest, the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus, and we, we, we receive God into our hearts. Maybe you or someone you know has received the anointing of the sick, where through the ministry of the priest, Jesus comes alongside those who are sick and heals them of their spiritual and physical wounds. Now, in the case of all these sacraments that I've just mentioned, there needs to be a priest in order for them to happen. It's a very simple math equation. I'm not good at math, but no priest, no sacraments. It's kind of how it works. And without a priest, these beautiful ways to access the grace of God and the sacraments, they're taken away. Now, why am I talking about them being taken away? Like, don't worry, we don't have some nefarious plot to cancel all the masses or, or stop confession times. That's not what I'm talking about. But I don't know if you know this, but in the church here in Canada, there is a massive crisis of shortage of priests. It may not seem like it when we look around here. You know, you've got two brand new, hot off the press, young associate pastors, a youngish pastor. <laughs> and, and, and we could be a little bit spoiled. Like, we got three priests here. What are you talking about, a priest shortage? Well, this isn't the norm, actually. We're a bit spoiled here. And even here, our numbers are, are getting stretched thin. This weekend, Father Daniel was at another parish in Truro, covering for a, a priest shortage there. Next weekend, I'm going to be traveling somewhere else to do the same thing. Our numbers are wearing thin. And even though we might not feel the effects of it right now, in the coming years, as the number of priests continues to drop, it's a very real possibility that our access to the sacraments could get less and less. So this, this makes me ask the question, has... Has this, mean, has this mean that God has stopped calling men to be priests? That God has just decided, you know what, I've had enough of being good, I've had enough of being forgiving, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna stop supplying my people with sacramental grace. Well, I hope you can tell from my tone of voice, no, absolutely not. God is still calling men to follow after him in this unique way of being his priest, of being his ambassadors of mercy, to our broken world, to be conduits of his grace to his people so that they can be washed clean of their brokenness, of their sin, and reconciled back into friendship with the Lord. I believe, not even just in, in kind of this grand universal way, but I believe even here at this parish, there are men, and yes, even boys, like little nine-year-old Isaac, who God is calling to be a priest right here in our parish. The problem is not that God has stopped calling men. The problem is that a lot of those men are not answering the call. Now, I don't want this to come across in a judgy way, like, how dare you, you know, pick up the phone, answer God's call. There are maybe some men who are hearing God's call to the priesthood and are maybe ignoring it or pushing it down because they're afraid or they have their own plans for their life. 
But I think the vast majority of missed callings to the priesthood actually come because the guy doesn't even have on his radar that God might be calling him. He's not even aware of how to hear God's voice. They haven't even honestly thought about whether God could be calling them to be a priest. It's kind of like if you were to, to use an analogy of getting mail. So the first guy who's kind of repressing his call, he's like someone who God has mailed a letter. He goes out to the mailbox, he opens it up, takes out the letter, opens the envelope. It's like, you are called to be a priest. He's like, Whoa. Wow, okay. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm going to put that back in the envelope, maybe leave it on the counter, maybe I'll look at it next weekend. That's one group. But the second group of guys, they don't even know that they have a mailbox to check, right? They have no idea that this is even something that could be possible. And this is because even in our church community, a lot of times we don't have a healthy culture of discernment. We don't know how to discern. And so what I want to do is propose that we at St. Benedict can help build a culture of discernment. You might have stuck with me this long in thinking, well, I'm a married man. I'm not called to be a priest, so I don't really have to pay attention to this homily. Or maybe you're, you're a woman thinking, yeah, I, I can't be a priest either, so I can just check out, right? Well, no, this is actually something that all of us have a responsibility to do together. All of us have a responsibility to build up a culture of discernment. So the first thing that all of us can do, without any exception, is we can pray for vocations. Pray for vocations, to offer up an extra rosary, to take on some extra penance and fasting, to maybe go before the Blessed Sacrament and beg the Lord to stir up the hearts of men to send out harvesters into his vineyard. And a second thing that we can do, I think the first thing we can all do is pray. The second thing, especially in families that we can do, is adopt a mentality that I like to call dare to discern. Dare to discern. And here I want to especially speak to the parents here. To grandparents as well, siblings as well, but especially to the parents. Parents, I don't know if you realize just how crucial a role you play in the formation of future priests by how you raise your sons. When you bring them to Mass, when you teach them how to listen to the voice of the Lord, when you teach them in their own little way to pray, you know, God, what do you want me to be when I grow up? You're teaching them tools of discernment. And one of the things you can do is just ask questions. Just ask a question like, hey, have you ever, have you ever thought about becoming a priest? When you see Father up at the altar, do you ever think, oh, I could do something like that? It's amazing what's going on in kids' minds. Not to pressure them or push them into it, but no one would have assumed that little seven-year-old Isaac was thinking about becoming a priest, but I was. God can speak to our youngest disciples here at the parish if we just ask them and see what he's saying. And don't discourage them either. Definitely don't push them into the priesthood, but don't discourage them either. I was talking with a youth minister, not from this parish, but another parish, and she was saying that she had brought a bunch of her teenagers to a retreat. And when they had come back, some of the boys in her youth group had really gotten fired up with the love of God. They, they came back saying, I think I might be called to the priesthood. And when they sat down and they told their parents, it was a heartbreaking response. Their parents sat them down and said, no son of mine is going to be a priest. No son of mine. I want grandkids. And they went to the youth minister and they said, if you put this idea in our son's minds again, we're pulling them out of the youth group. So these are like the two extremes, right? Don't push your kid into becoming a priest. Don't discourage them. And if you fall into either of those two camps, let me just humbly invite you to surrender the plan for your children's life to God. Allow them to discern. Allow them to dare to discern. Because God has a plan for their life that will make them happy. He really will. My parents always said to me when I was growing up, me and all my siblings, whatever God wants you to do is what we want you to do. Wherever God is calling you, that's where you'll be most happy. That is what will make us most happy. You don't have to do anything to make us happy. Follow God. That is the perfect way to get your kids to dare to discern. And finally, I want to speak to any of the young men here. I invite you to open up yourself to the possibility that God might be calling you to be a priest. 
Sometimes that's the scariest part. It's just opening yourself up to the possibility. Lord, if you want me to be a priest, I'll say yes. I give you permission. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because as soon as you start thinking about it, I guarantee you the devil is going to come in and he's going to start whispering some lies that sound like, you're not smart enough. You're not holy enough. What will other people think of you? You're going to be lonely. Silence all those lies and listen to the voice of the good shepherd who loves you and has a good plan for your life. I was blessed to grow up in a culture of discernment with my family, with my homeschool group that I was a part of, with my Catholic university that I ended up going to, eventually with the Companions of the Cross who helped me discern altogether. And my heart's desire was to be a priest who could dedicate his life to ministering to the people of God through the sacraments. And I love it so far. I've only been a priest for a month, but I love it so far. I really do. I've been able to hear confessions, which is so humbling because a sinner like me gets to sit with another sinner and help him or her find God. I obviously can't go into the details, but it's powerful. It's a powerful sacrament. To stand at the altar as a priest and hold in my hands bread and wine and watch it become Jesus it's mind-blowing. It's incredible. And I'm so not worthy of it, but Lord, he's doing this miracle through me to feed his people. I've even been able to anoint someone, this little kid who was about to go into surgery, and just to see Jesus come alongside those who are sick and wounded and be with them and minister them. I love being a priest, but I'm not the only one that God is calling. Men, and boys from this parish are being called to follow Jesus as his priests. And wouldn't it be awesome, just imagine it, wouldn't it be awesome if our parish, we suddenly saw this whole group of guys actively discerning the priesthood, praying and seeking the Lord's will for their life, if this is where he's calling them, if we as a parish could raise up the next generation of big-hearted priests who love the Lord, who love his people, wouldn't it be amazing if we could all work together to build up a culture where that could happen? It starts right here. It starts with our prayer. It starts with our encouragement. And it starts with men who are bold and courageous enough to say yes to the Lord.